welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. And that includes welcoming back the amazing Tony Bell. How are you? I am doing great. Happy Friday the 13th, everyone's favorite lucky day. <laughs> oh my gosh, I should be wearing an orange and black hat. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you can, Tony. you can save that for October 31st. It's okay. <laughs> That's true. Or just days when I'm a little bit off. <laughs> Well, this is going to be a great, great conversation because we've all heard, oh, the check is in the mail. Mm -hmm. And how do we navigate that? And it's going to be through diversifying revenue. And so we're going to talk about this because this puts back so much pressure onto the fundraiser, trying to not only secure a transaction, secure a donation. And when I use the word transaction, I'm saying funding, you know, something that comes through a funder and all that. And then we're also having to make sure the checks arrive. And it is so arduous and so difficult. One more thing that fundraisers often have to do. And it's just, it's a real bummer. But before we get started, you know, what's not a bummer are our amazing partners. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, which is our new episode, which you're here today with us and your part-time controller. Um, you know, we have these amazing co-hosts. And again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by the amazing Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy, one of the wise minds in our sector. Before we get going, I'm going to put you on the spot a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, can you share what you told me in the green room about going to an AFP meeting about just how it like energized you and witness to that? Yeah, for, for sure. I think many folks have been working in this virtual space now for a long time and and don't lean into these opportunities con to connect with folks face to face. So this past week, uh, well, actually it was this week, <laughs> time flies. Uh, or, yeah, so it was this week uh, and it was the our local AFP chapter and the local Plan Giving Council chapter. Every year, the two chapters come together and, and do a collaborative event. Uh, and it just fed my soul. It was such a great, great event. Uh, and, and it was great because of the quality of individuals that were there and the level of engagement that took place. It wasn't great because there were 80 or 100 people there. It was great because there were 35 people there that wanted to be there, that wanted to connect with others, that wanted to share best practices uh, yeah. and, and get to know each other. And, and really one of the most exciting aspects of that experience this week were the, the folks that are emerging leaders in our community that were there. Uh, that, you know, I, I met this this one young lady that was like, oh my gosh, tell me more. Like she was, she wanted the info, right? She wanted right. the intel. She wanted the secret ingredients uh, mm -hmm. and was asking just dynamite questions and, and really just so engaged. Uh, and it was exciting to see an emerging leader, you know, want that kind of knowledge, actively seeking it, but very yeah. conscious around succession planning and how she has a responsibility, uh, and she verbalized this, how she feels like she has a responsibility to engage younger indiv individuals in philanthropy and to engage younger individuals in looking at this space as a career path. So it was super exciting and, and just, I, I was so elevated and, and, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of kind of gas in the tank, if you will, uh, after that experience. Well, thank you for sharing that, because I think that's one of the things is that sometimes we look upon these uh, professional uh, gatherings as kind of like a slog. Like, OK, you know, and I think that this is what they're for. Right. They're to elevate, you know, peers and to get everybody that is doing the same type of work in the same room so that you can kind of elevate together. And so yay team, I think this is great. And I and I wanted to just breach, uh, briefly touch on it, Tony, because now through the summer, you know, these events are gonna start popping up in our communities and more scheduled. And at the same time, we're entering a really busy season where sometimes I think it's easy to say, oh, I, I'm exhausted, I got too much to do or, you know, 
I'll, I'll catch him the next one. And I love that you said it filled your tank. <laughs> it really did. And I think one of the reasons why it was successful is that it was intended to be very organic once you arrived. So other okay. than the board chair of the plan giving council and the board chair of our local AFP chapter, just giving some quick updates and, you know, on what's going on. There wasn't a speaker there. It wasn't a workshop. There was no agenda. Uh, so folks really did have the majority of that time to invest in one another. I love it. I, I am so glad that you brought that up and that we were able to chat about this because it's, um, you know, this is being played out across our country um, and in North America. I mean, really, we have AFP chapters all over the world and we do have, you know, these types of things going on. And so it's a great reminder that um, we do need to support this. And, um, you know, maybe you change the trajectory of that young woman's career and that ultimately she'll she'll bring in other donors or raise more money for her community. I mean, it's pretty awesome. So thank you. Thank no, you for thank, sharing. Thank you for bringing it up for sure. Yeah. Well, let's get to the, the big question. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Why in the heck do we need to diversify nonprofit revenue? I mean, we either got it or we don't. Right? Or no? <laughs> No, I totally agree with you. And, you know, again, it, I think some of these bullet points here around long-term sustainability, right, reduction of risk, uh, donor-based distribution. I mean, we I'm going to use phrases we've heard like through our entire life. So I'll just warn everybody now, right? I'm going to use all of those things. I'm, I'm going to say all those things. Uh, but, it, you know, it just goes back to, you know, all of your eggs in one basket, right. <laughs> you know, right. and, and what what happens when you are like merrily going along with that basket and you fall and, and crush all the eggs? So, you know, it really is that. And, and that's the importance. And, and in my experience, Julian, I'm sure yours, you've either been with an organization or have supported an organization where their funding was too heavy in one direction. Yeah. And most of the time that direction is either in a single donor yeah. or or a government grant. Uh, and so I was mm -hmm. supporting a local nonprofit who received close to 100% of their funding through state and federal grants, which was all really great until the one year where there was a 40% reduction in the funding that they received from the state. So they had to very quickly figure out how they were going to now diversify their funding. Uh, and it was a fire drill because, you know, again, they were just merrily we go along, you know, assuming that these, these either large donors or these funding sources from local or federal grants are always going to be there for us. Uh, right. So it, it's really important. Uh, and, and even when you diversify, there's going to be one part of that giving pie that's larger than the others. Sure. Right. Very rarely yeah. you're going to be like, oh, I got 25% here, 25% here, 25% here, right? Uh -huh. uh, it's going to be all over the place. But one of them is going to be heavier than the others. Mm -hmm. uh, but making sure, again, just that you have plans in place and, and you know what you're going to do when that larger piece of the pie ends up having to shrink for whatever reason. For whatever reason. So let me ask you two questions and they kind of relate, but I'm thinking about, you know, we were talking last week about um, preparing for your annual review. And one of the things we talked about, which you brought up so beautifully, was about understanding what your goals are and your objectives and, and where that was laid out and what you have done or what you've changed or, you know, all that. Have you ever seen goals set where it forces that fundraiser to automatically kind of diversify versus just saying, here's a number? Because I think it's human nature. If you have a, you know, a, a million dollar goal and, and let's just say that's it, you're going to, I think, instinctively go towards relationships and funding opportunities that are large to, that get you there versus, oh yeah, I'm going to spend all this extra time and go after the $5,000 donor. Mm -hmm. 
donor, right? Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So yeah. we kind of we artificially push our people to think with these bigger, like one gift is going to solve all of our problems. I don't know yeah, how we get I, around that. Yeah, well, it, it's a great question, and and where my head is going immediately is is we're always trying to be mindful of our our audience, and and mm -hmm. some some of our audience are with large you know, fundraising teams, some of our audience, they are the team. <laughs> so right. when, I, when I think about diversification of funding and what that looks like, that diversification takes place when you're putting your annual plan together. So okay. when you're, when you receive your budget for the year, this is what advancement or the development department is expected to raise then you take that amount of money and that's when you start looking at how are you going to take that expectation and break it down into diversified pieces. Uh, and so again, for a larger institution, you may have a team that's very focused on major gifts. You right. may have a team that's very focused on special events. Uh, right. You may have a team that's very focused on uh, just the annual giving campaign. Right. Uh, you may have a team that's very focused on peer-to-peer uh, -peer giving and recurring gifts. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are all just kind of the things that make up a diversified fundraising plan. Uh, and I think it depends on the organization and the resources available in terms of who is activating those pieces of the diversification plan. So your mm -hmm. question so in most cases, for me, I worked mostly in smaller shops where I either was the development team yeah. or there were maybe two or three other folks. So again, when we were given that number, I knew that I had to raise $2 million. Mm -hmm. The board, it didn't matter to the board how I raised $2 million right. uh, or to the executive director or CEO. Uh, but it's smart to have many kind of avenues to try and reach that mm -hmm. goal. And that's where the initial diversification conversation starts is in the planning of how do we reach that goal. Mm -hmm. You know, Tony, it's really interesting when I, to hear you lay out the, the ways that this could go. It almost seems like your advice would be something that could show up in a strategic plan where you're saying in terms of our development team, th this is what we have now. You know, we have three people in place and we got to do the $2 million. But ultimately, you know, by the end of year one, we want to have a team or we want to have leadership for planned giving or we want to have leadership on reoccurring donations. I mean, all of those things versus just saying, how do we raise more money, being more strategic on, on where our talent and our management's going to reside. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, it, and again, it depends not only on kind of the, the size of the development team, whether again, it's one person or, or 50, but also the organization and, and how they're structured. So I've had the, the privilege of working with organizations where pretty much 90% of their funding was all through special events. So I was a director of special events. I think we had five directors of special events for this national organization. Each of us had 12 events on our annual calendar that we were responsible for. Uh, so that was 12 committees, 12 different sponsorship packets, you know, and, but the, it was event, 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 event. And then the national office kind of took care of, you know, legacy gifts, larger, you know, gifts, federal grants, they did that. But at the chapter mm -hmm. level, all of the funds generated were through special events. Mm -hmm. Then I also supported an organization that had a call center and that's how they they still have a call center that dials for dollars and raises i don't know how many millions of dollars annually through 10 and 20 dollar donations mm -hmm. through the call center and what the call center is generating and then they do some special events really just for brand recognition and credibility but the bulk of the funding for them is, is happening through a call center uh, which you really don't hear much about anymore. No, you don't. And we need to probably, uh, uh, I'll make a commitment to drill down on that and see if we can find some more um, information. You know, I, I'm thinking about 
in college, I was recruited because I was a legacy uh, student, um, a third generation placement. And um, my sister also went to the same school and we would we were asked to come into the offices of the administration and call the the men who had gone to school with our dad and say, hey, our dad just ponied up X. You know, you want to pony up X or whatever. And we would do these like telethon or races or whatever. And that was kind of like my last. And that's been a long time. That's kind of been my last uh, thought of that, you know, but how it worked. And um, wow, call center. OK, that you just like. I got to think, I got to think about that. Cause that's very, I, interesting. It, was, it was, yeah, it's, it's very unique. And, and I, the only thing I'm thinking in, in your scenario, at least it was a little bit of a warm call because at least there was some yeah. relationship that you could connect, you know, the individual yeah. to. <laughs> um, well, and it was, it was kind of a shame, you know, I'm going to shame you into this gift. Oh, oh yeah. I, I felt that the minute you said it. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it, I mean, to be very blunt. Yeah. Cause you know, yeah, I would, we identified ourselves and you know, literally, well, my dad just gave X, you know, you want to join him or what? God, it was awful. I mean, as a kid, I thought, well, this is fun. I'm talking to my dad's, you know, alums and, uh, cool. you know, some of these men I had met throughout my life, it was a men's school. And then when, uh, at my generation, they started letting women in, but, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's very, it's a very interesting thing to have that call, uh, perspective. And so we need to, we need to look into that. Okay. Well, let's keep going. I mean, you've got my mind pinging cause I'm, I'm like talking about all these different things, but that kind of leads us into this multiple fundraising channels and how do we, it just seems so frightening to, you know, we know intellectually, Tony, we need to diversify. We need mm -hmm. to get those eggs in different baskets. Mm -hmm. But it seems so frightening when you've got the hammer of a goal um, to say, okay, I'm going to try something new. How do you advise us to kind of embrace that? Yeah, well, I, I think the first thing to do is to look at the skill set of your team, again, whether that's okay. one person or, or 50, uh, and see where their strengths are. Are, are kind of sitting when you look at the different ways in which you can diversify the funding. Uh, and then you just kind of, you know, you connect the talent to that, that lane, uh, that mm -hmm. diversification lane. So that, that's kind of the, the first place I would start uh, looking at existing data uh, that you might have around uh, kind of donor activity, uh, understanding the market that you're in, uh, if your market is already saturated with special events, then maybe that's not the first kind of spoke in your diversification wheel that you're going to activate. Mm -hmm. uh, you might put that on the back burner and look at something else so that you can understand whether or not whatever it is that you might want to implement uh, is going to have a return and, and not be too competitive uh, mm -hmm. in the market that you're serving. One more question for you before we move on. At this stage, when we're looking at diversification, do you advise us to actually set goals and OKRs for this so that it's not just like, gee, this would be great. We, we don't want all our eggs in one basket to keep repeating that phrase, but to really hammer down, okay, this is what our goal is when we're first trying to start this? Yeah, well, I, I think that you, yes, I, I agree, Julia. I think you have to have those goals mm -hmm. uh, because you need to measure the success of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, if, if, we're, if we were to say 75% uh, is going to be from individual donors, we want to kind of, you know, and I don't know, my numbers aren't happening well in my head right now, but let's just say we want to diversify and we want to diversify in some way uh, that is going to be like maybe 10 or 15% of the total sum of what we're raising, then yes, you want to set that okay. OKR or, or KPI to support that new activity and what the expected revenue uh, or donations might be, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for that, for that lane. So yes, mm -hmm. I think that it's really important to have those goals and and set them and monitor them and and have benchmarks, you know, of course, to check in and and see how it how it's going. Yeah, and I think also to communicate that to your board and and C suite, mm -hmm. because otherwise, I feel like the, the 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 development team and fundraisers, 
have one number looming over their head. And that one number, it's like they're a winner or they're a loser. It's such a bad way to look at things, right? As opposed to having, you know, a more of a, a pyramid approach to all the different types of goals. And, and, uh, and like you said, the KPI so that, you know, you're, you're marching towards that, that number. Um, but and, it seems like we don't do that. Well, and, and I think sometimes for organizations, diversification does not happen because organizations tend to be risk adverse. Uh, yeah you know, not wanting to, to take any risks or, or shake things up. Uh, yeah. and, and this week there was a dynamite show right around that, uh, that topic on, mm -hmm. on the nonprofit show I thought this week, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. around, you know, taking risks and, and, you know, understanding yes. how to do that within your organization. So, mm -hmm. so sometimes folks get kind of caught up in, uh, you know, in, in being risk adverse, when yeah. it comes to implementing anything new and, and diversifying uh, the mm -hmm. funding. But but I would say it, it's, it's again, it's just really important regardless of how long you've been receiving funding from a particular source. Uh, again, an example is in the state of Florida, the governor vetoed all funding for arts organizations across the state. So he vetoed that line item out of the state budget, first time that's ever, ever happened. Uh, so, of course, all of the arts and culture organizations that have historically relied on and, and, and with good consistency, uh, you know, have relied on that. Now they're finding that there's going to be a gap in that mm -hmm. state funding that they have historically for years and years and years and years, you know, received. Oh. So smaller foundations are kind of jumping in and helping to fill the void, uh, but they're scrambling. Yeah. Uh, oh, my and, gosh. I think part of that might be, I don't know for sure, but I would, you know, my, my guess would be that some of that scrambling for some of the organizations is a lack of diversified streams. Sure. Because you're, you're, you're looking at that one number for most, you know, most of us, you know, the board is looking at it, the finance department's looking at it, the C-suite's looking at it, you know, and then, then all of a sudden big shock and you got to, you got to wrestle that away. You know, we don't have a lot of time left. And before we move on, I want to talk to you about what you're seeing in terms of leveraging events. You you mentioned that, you know, the 12 events that you are responsible for. Um, holy cow. What are you thinking about this? And do you have like a general fundraising sensibility? Just my personal opinion is if, if you are hosting an annual gala, you know, and it's the 25th year of your annual gala mm -hmm. uh, and you're you're raising, you know, I mean, it really just depends on what that return looks like. What you know, what is the net that that you're earning? If you're if you're raising a million dollars or more and that's your net in a gala. Just make sure you're 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 providing a great guest experience. Don't. Don't get rid of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we have always had an opportunity uh, to do better at cultivation and stewardship of event attendees mm -hmm. after the event has happened. Uh, yes. So I mean, we could do a show on kind of what that looks like, or and, and I'm sure there has been a show on what that looks like mm -hmm. uh, because there's been so many incredible topics covered uh, over the years, Julia, that you've been doing this show. But, but that's how I feel about levering events and, and moving away from them. If it's, you really have, to, there has to be a really great return on investment in terms of the net uh, for the event, or it has to be part of a larger vision and strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes you need those smaller events as kind of the, the onboarding, if you will, or the first yeah. point of contact or introduction to the yeah. organization. Uh, and so in that case, your follow-up afterwards is even more important mm -hmm. uh, so that you can think about how you're carrying that ROI beyond, mm -hmm. you know, the, the event. You know, we've talked about this before. I mean, I'm on the rubber chicken circuit um, in my community. I was raised on the rubber chicken circuit. I've got, you know, I'm always going to things. And I am shocked at how few of these events actually do stewardship follow-up. 
-hmm. And you can tell the staff is like, oh, thank God this event is over. I'm exhausted. My feet hurt, whatever. <laughs> Versus like, okay, the event is only the start of what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's just such a, a hard thing to witness day in and day out. You know, the organizations that drop the ball, literally drop the ball. Um, and it's, to me, to your point, it, it's, yeah, you need to understand the, the data and the metrics on what the, the input versus output, what's the revenue versus your cost, undoubtedly. But it's also, to me, more strategic. You know, if you're going to have an event are, and you're not going to get back to everybody who was there or have some sort of systematic approach to it, can you do that with 25 people? And just your general, you know, your your general course of a of a month or a quarter or whatever. And I don't think we look at it that way. I don't think our fundraisers are saying, what is the implication of all this time served for towards an event where I'm not going out and meeting with donors, you know, because I'm doing I'm picking out the, you know, the the napkins and the linens. Right. Well, I, I think a key to this process, too, in, in terms of really, you know, carrying that ROI beyond, you know, the event itself uh, is some of the work that you have to do before the event even happens, again, beyond kind of the linens, the entertainment, the PowerPoint, but taking a look at your guest list prior to the event yeah. and saying, OK, we want to make sure that a, a staff member or a board member goes to this individual and says hello and thanks them for being there mm -hmm. uh, or goes up to them and says hello and invites them to a coffee or something nice. uh, down the road. So there's a lot of that stewardship uh, mm -hmm. that can take place at the event uh, mm -hmm. as well. So uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's important and, and valuable to take a look at those guest lists prior yeah. to the event and, and do mm -hmm. some, some strategizing there as well. I agree. Well, again, you know, I could talk to you forever. One last quick thing, and this is um, super, uh, again, I've been talking too much. Our time's whittled away um, because this, this needs a much deeper conversation, but recurring uh, donation programs. What are your thoughts on this in terms of, are, are we as a sector not doing this enough? Or could we, you know, raise this up? a general rule of thumb of where we should be on this? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I mean, the concept, of course, is fantastic. I don't have any data in front of me to kind of support its success other than knowing from my own experience that it's it's always nice to kind of look at, at your donor base and know that a certain percentage of them are yeah. giving every month. So, yeah. uh, so, you, you know, it just, it feels good and, and you know that you kind of have that coming in every month. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are just, again, so many different ways that you can implement recurring donor programs. One of the, I think, obstacles for some organizations, again, when we're mindful of, of our audience, is the investment in some of the platforms that allow you to do this yeah. really successfully. Uh, okay. But there's so many of them at so many different price points and different apps and stuff that uh, if there were ever a time to lean into recurring donations, now is the time because the tools are there to help yeah. you succeed in that. Yeah, I can remember, you know, back in the day, uh, you would run it on spreadsheets and you'd have their credit card numbers. And then, you know, the last day of the month or the first day of the month, you'd run the credit cards. And what a ridiculous thing. And now that's we don't have to mess with that. So yeah, much, yeah, much improved. Again, this is always just a, a wonderful time that we get to spend with you, Tony. Um, you're just such a master of knowledge in our nonprofit sector and, and so willing to share and teach us and, and help us through this process. And uh, so I say thank you very, very much. I also want to say thank you to our amazing sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that allow us to have these conversations. And so we want to make sure that we give them their due um, and support. Okay, Tony, you really gave me a lot of um, thoughts here. Um, I don't want to be living with the checks in the mail. That's a horrible way to live, right? 
Yes. No, no, absolutely. And and again, even if you even if you have a an angel that has gifted you, you know, you have that one major donor, just keep in mind, you know, just keep in mind that you you want to diversify and and you you want to give as many folks as possible an opportunity to participate and support your work. I love that. That for me is the best way to end this conversation because you're right. We want people to be able to enjoy being um, partners with us and stewards of our organizations. That's a wonderful way to end this. Thank you, Tony. Hey, as we end every episode of the nonprofit show, we leave with this message. It's simple, but it's complicated. And it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you.